let us stand. Praise you, Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. From the top, my hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but hope.
it with our voices. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels. of our faith. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze upon your loveliness, when all things that surround me become shadows, Yeah. 
Father, we thank you for your word as health and life to us. Keeping over there is great reward, Father God. I thank you, Lord, for our hearts, our prepared to receive this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we ask that you bless this time, Lord God, with your presence. Thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. We thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please grab a seat. Thank you, sir. Don't quit, Peter. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We had a lovely time here yesterday. Praise the God. Joel and Tui got mawied. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It was awesome. It was a great day. So thank you to all those that helped out. And we had um, Peter here early in the morning and Nathan putting the church back together. Awesome. All those that helped out with the service, fantastic. Excellent. All right. Got a word for you. Praise the Lord. Please hold the line. Part four. Part four in the series of Please Hold the Line. The title of the series is inspired by um, a customer service or call center when you ring up and you ask for some help and they say, please hold the line. <laughs> can you please hold the line? We're going to put you through to someone who can help. It, I bring up Nova. We lost our Wi-Fi down down there and uh, he said exactly the same those words please hold the line I just kind of had a little snicker to myself <laughs> well I put you through to somebody else uh, sometimes it can take a while and it truly there is a test of our patience amen it truly tests our patience it happens with our walk with God too everybody has to go through a waiting season everybody has to know how to manage or handle that time um, for when we ask or are promised some things to when we receive. And there's this kind of bracket and time in, in between. And how we handle that time will determine whether we win and see breakthrough or whether we fail and jump ship prematurely. And so we're looking at um, winning here. We're going to win. We're going to see the breakthrough. We're going to re receive what was promised to us. Turn with me, please, uh, to Psalm 27 and verse 7.
Psalm 27, verse 7. Psalm 27 and verse 7. And it reads, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen, amen. So we're looking at some things that we can do. You can ask a question, well, what can I do when I've been put on hold or am I waiting breakthrough in my life? How do I keep myself strong during this waiting season? So we've looked at a couple of things so far, and there's only three things I kind of want to cover during the series. Uh, number one, of course, is read the Word. Read the Word. Read the Bible. Even if you want to just read the Word for, uh, to make yourself look knowledgeable, <laughs> or come to a mental and a sense of some sort. For the born-again believer, the word targets the heart. It will travel past your headspace and will knock on, and try to, uh, uh, knock on the walls of your heart and it will eventually penetrate. The word is, is different to any other encyclopedia or a dictionary. It, will, it aims for the heart. And that's where maximum fruition occurs. Amen. Uh, Here's a real cool scripture. Turn with me to Jeremiah 15. And verse 16. Concerning the word. Chapter 15. And verse 16. Excellent. So your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Let's read that again. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name. We've got to find, this isn't grievous to us. Okay, this isn't a book of thou shalt nots. This is a book of freedom. This is your joy will be found in here. Your rejoicing in life is found in this book. And so if you were during a waiting time to consume this, to eat this word up, it'll put you in a good position to win. Win in life, to be victorious. Praise the Lord. So first one is read the word. Secondly is pray. Pray. Pray with understanding. You can pray with understanding with words that you can understand. But also pray in tongues. And we looked at 10 reasons. Uh, if you wanted to look through those again, just revise your notes, or you can revisit our Facebook or YouTube and re go back through those again. Um, but it was excellent. <coughs> pray in tongues. Ten reasons why you should pray in tongues. And number three, what we're going to have a look at today, number three, what can I do when I'm being put on hold or I'm awaiting breakthrough or I'm waiting on God for some things, is have a heart for the house. Number three is have a heart for the house. Turn with me to 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. All right, 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. It reads, moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God. I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I've prepared for the holy house. Out of my own special treasure of gold and silver. Let's read that again. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, 
I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house and my own special treasure of gold and of silver. Now that word affection in the Hebrew is the word rotsor, which is R-A-T-S-A-H, R-A-T-S-A-H. And it means pleasure, to be pleased with or to be delighted with. So what we see here is, is King David, he's saying, I've set my affection on the house of the Lord. This place here is where I put my delight. This is where I am well, where I've set my, my pleasure in. And so God's plan for all believers, for all people in this world is to be part of his church. His church is God's plan for the earth. God has not called anybody to be lone rangers. Now there are missionaries, of course, that are sent out into the wilderness, into the jungles or where, wherever they're meant to be, but they're all under the covering of the church. God's church. It's quite interesting in uh, uh, Matthew 16, Jesus is walking with his disciples and he turns to them and he says, who do, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? And so his disciples kind of, you know, what are people saying about the Lord? Well, some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some people even suggest you're John the Baptist, your cousin. So he says to them, he goes, well, what about you guys? The ones that are walk with me, that are closest to me. Who do you say that I am? So Peter steps up. Don't worry, boys, I got this one. <laughs> he says, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who was in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This is the first time Jesus uses the word ecclesia. And so the disciples would have heard the word church for the first time. So they would have been sitting there going, yeah, yeah, what is he talking about? I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. In the Greek, it means it's a gathering of believers, a holy convocation. What is it? What is this? John, James, have you, has he talked to you about Ecclesia? But I'll build my church on this rock. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. And so after the day of Pentecost began, the church age began, 2,000 years. The church age hadn't begun yet. When Jesus said this in Matthew 16, church age began on the day of Pentecost when 120 believers came down. 120 Jesuses came out of that upper room. Powered just like him. The devil thought he won when he took, took Jesus to the cross. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, if he had known, he would, never have, he would never have let the Lord go to the cross. But he is so mindful of the things of man, he, there was no way he could see he lost the anointing on, on being able to think on that, that divine plane, that divine scope. But 120 Jesuses came down that day. And the, and the church age began. And the church age, as predicted, as prophesied, will last 2,000 years. And you know what? We're at the end of the end of the church age. 2,000 years is up. And, and we're, we're at... We're the glorious church that has kind of all been worked up, worked up to be for, before Jesus comes. <laughs> Still feels like we've got some ways to go. But I believe that uh, God is, is a perfect in all his ways. He is a master designer. What he dispensates is flawless. And so in the end times, I believe that there will be a, a, uh, a moving of the Holy Ghost, a thrusting on his people, uh, and we, we will know when, he was about, when he's about to come. And I think we'll all have a sense of urgency to save as many as we can, to get out there and uh, uh, take as many as we can with us. And so in the Old and New Testament, they're called... Um, the dispensation of the church in the Old and New Testament was called the mystery. They didn't, they didn't know what the church was. They didn't know that there could be such a thing 
as a gathering of believers that were, spirit, were filled with the Holy Ghost. And so uh, uh, Pastor Bob, the Indian, says that it's not something uh, that they could understand back then. They didn't, they didn't understand what, what this, this ecclesia was. They didn't understand what, what that meant. And so they called it the mystery. And so we, there's heaps of, heaps of scriptures in the Bible that talks about this mystery. But the mystery is the church. It's, you guys are the mysterious bunch. They're, they're, they're kind of had glimpses of in the future. Isn't that awesome? I don't think they could think in their wildest dreams when 120 Jesuses came down that there would be so many of us around the world that have the Holy Spirit. Saved by, the G- by Jesus, the one that they followed for three years. Amazing. And so the only ones that could understand it at that point in time was the only three, was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The angels didn't even know. Satan didn't even know. The demons didn't even know. But we are in the age of the church, and it's almost at an end. And so this ecclesial gathering of believers, a fellowship of the brethren, has a variety of functions to build this impenetrable forces, fortress that to the darkest of forces can't even hold us back. So when it talks about the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us, it means it can't hold us out. They're on the defensive, not us. A lot of people use that scripture to think that we're on the defensive, trying to keep the forces of darkness out of the church. That's not true. We have the upper as far as spiritual power goes. They cannot hold us out of the world to go and rescue You got that. And so it's us that are, that are invading the forces of darkness. And so they get the, the gates of Hades cannot withhold us back. We're going to bust through with the, with the battering ram and, and rescue as many as we can. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, number one, the variety of functions that a church has, obviously, is to hear the word. Because we can look at the, uh, the, this ecclesia. What is the function of ecclesia? What is the re- main reason why we are to gather here together? If Jesus made us saved or we, are, are, we receive salvation, then why would a whole bunch of us have to come together every week? It has a reason. There is a purpose. There is a function. Because number one is to hear the word. Hear the word. Turn with me to Romans 10 and verse 14, please. Romans 10 and verse 14. And it reads, where are we there? Romans 10, verse 14. Excellent. It reads, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, the Lord, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So pastors and teachers have been given by God to the believers. It's to break open the bread of life, to build and sustain us as a body. We, we serve a specific function and building you up for the week. So that when you're out there, you, you guys are, what uh, verse 14 is actually what they're talking about. You bring the good news to the lost. When you penetrate the dark forces and you tell somebody about the freedom in Jesus, then you are doing the work of the gospel. You're going about my father's business. And so we come back here together. We get built up again, wash all the, the, the pepper of the world off. <laughs> and I build you up in faith and then we get sent back out into the world again. And so we need to be light in dark places. Pushing back that dark places. Telling somebody about Jesus. 
And so we break open the bread of life. We have an anointing on our lives to build and sustain us as a body. All right. Secondly, uh, and number two, what is the main function of the church, according to the word, uh, is that this is a house of prayer. It's quite interesting, um, when Jesus cleanses the temple, he actually did it a couple of times. He comes in and there's people with merchandise everywhere, buying and selling and that kind of stuff. And he doesn't have a fit of rage to begin with. He takes his time. He sits down and he's looking around him and he starts threading a, uh, uh, a whip together himself. Probably getting angrier and angrier as, he, as, he's, as he's putting this, this weapon together. And uh, we kind of get this mistake that Jesus is this bearded lady. I know we've seen some photos of, or paintings or portraits of Jesus that kind of makes him look like this dainty kind of little man. But he was able to single-handedly cleanse out a temple. It's not like they kind of, when he started throwing stuff out the world, just like, whoa, back up. Okay, everybody, let's clear out. He would have thrusted them out himself. I see him more as this kind of, he is a, a man of peak physical condition. He'd been strong. No ailments, no sicknesses, no diseases on his body for, for the entirety of his life. So when he started thrusting up tables and he started pushing people out of here, he says these words, he goes, get out of here. This is a house. You've made, this is my father's house, which is a house of prayer. But you made it into a den of thieves. So father's house is a house of prayer. That's why we pray here. It needs to be a house of prayer. And so I, I like that picture of Jesus just sitting there taking time threading his weapon. <laughs> it's going, oh man, you guys are going to get a good fonging. <laughs> going to smash you. And so he defended his father's house. This is a house of prayer. And so the main function of a church here is, is to pray. One of the main functions. And number three, what we're going to look at, what is the main function of the house? Having a heart for the house is to build others. Is to build others. You know, I've done some uh, research, and there are 59 one, one another's in the New Testament. One another's. Pray for one another. Love one another. Forgive one another. Help one another. Carry one another. 59 one another's in the New Testament. And so gathering or fellowshipping together, the ecclesia, everybody brings a supply to church. The supply has varying degrees. <laughs> now, if you come here to listen to the word and then leave straight away, you still bring a supply. I remember my wife and I, we sat here um, uh, in a, at a, a funeral recently. And um, the guy who was taking the fu funeral, he said he looks out and he's able to see the different faces and he can know who, who are the most receptive. Now, we've never met him before, but he came up to us afterwards and goes, man, you guys were just so receptive to the word. And I said, oh, it's because you ministered so well. This is to unsafe, saved and unsaved family and friends. He goes, because you ministered so well. And he says, but we could see you down the back, and we were able to bring our supply. When I minister the word, when I'm looking around, I can see those that are, 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 willing, are so receptive to the word. They're willing to receive bring a supply and that, that 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 can help the minister the preacher or they can kind of put them off sometimes <laughs> and so you bring a supply and so the supply has varying degrees praise the lord but your presence here adds to the house your presence here adds to the house turn with me to uh, first corinthians 12 and verse 14 Now, there's the other end of the spectrum, too, where people bring a, a huge supply. I mean, we had um, Sherry and Peter and Grace and them working the uh, Christmas do last week. They worked their butts off putting together that Christmas meal for us. And so, so some people really kind of invest themselves into the, into the house of the Lord. So they set their affections on the house of God. 
because the, you esteem it to what's, what, what happens here is important. All right, who's there at 1 Corinthians 12? Verse 14? Okay, let's have a look at this. We're looking at the function of the church. Verse 14, it says, In fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not of a hand, I am not a hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing? And if the whole were a hearing, where would the, the smelling be? But now God has set members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if there were all one member, where would the body be? But indeed, you are not many members. Uh, you, there are many members, yet one body. So they're talking about that everybody here has a specific design, a specific gift. Uh, but here's a couple of things worth highlighting. And here's a challenge to you. Don't be the false teeth of the body of Christ. Sometimes you're here, sometimes you ain't. <laughs> Jesus is uh, coming back for a glorious bride, right? Now when he pulls the veil back and the bride smiles like this, He might go back home. <laughs> All right? Don't be the false teeth of the body of Christ. You have a function here as part of the body. Don't be found missing. Amen? Uh, Romans 12, verses 4 to 6. I'll just read this to you. It says, For as many, we have many members but, uh, in one body. But all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're all one body, but we all have different gifts. All right. Having then gifts differing according to the grace. Now that word grace is, is emphatic of empowerment that is given to us, then let us use them. Use your gifts here in this house. Some people have great gifts in administration. Some people have great gifts in gardening. Some people have great gifts in, in hospitality. Some people have great gifts in singing and, and playing the guitar and bass. Worshipping the Lord. Then let us use them with one another. Or let them use them and serve them with one another. We need more people down on the sound desk. Isn't that right, Nathan? <laughs> so if you've got a sound for, for some sound in that, then let us use them. You all, everyone can bring a supply. Everyone can bring gifts and supporting the house of the Lord. Second thing I want to highlight out of these verses that we just read is beware of, of negative self-talk. Beware of negative self-talk. What we find here with each of these inferences is that they are saying those things to themselves. And they want somebody else's gifts. So, oh, I'm, I'm just a nose. Man, I wish I was an eye. Or I'm just a foot. They always cover me up with a sock and a shoe. But the hand, oh no, the hand is out there free. Wish that was a hand. And so they have this kind of negative self-talk that you, you kind of think that you ain't good enough. Or that your gifts aren't, aren't going to be appreciated in some way. We need to be wary of that, that negative self-talk. How God's created you is how God's created you. His design is flawless. Is, is with precision. You can't be somebody that you're not. Don't be somebody that you're not. I remember um, I was listening to Papa Hagen. He was talking about a pastor who got fired because his wife ran off with, um, who was a, a secretary, ran off with someone in the church. And because of the constitution, if you couldn't keep your marriage, then you'd, you'd have to, res they'd force you to resign from being pastor. It wasn't his fault. And so um, he started a business and started succeeding really well a business. And so, you know, he was just making lots of money and he just thought that, you know, that was, that was it. That we just closed the chapter on that book and decided to move on. Constant, you know, we all know what the Constitution says. But he gets woken up about three in the morning, one morning, a number of years later. 
and the Holy Ghost shook him to his core and quoted Romans 11.29, which says, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I created you the way I created you, and I am not sorry about it. Isn't that powerful? You're not a mistake. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? The gifts and callings of the Lord are without repentance. New King James says this, the, the gifts and callings of the Lord are irrevocable. It's a great word. And so he decided to drop the business, get back into pastoring. He became a, a hugely successful pastor. It wasn't his fault that, this, that these other external things had happened. He just got back into the, the call of God and how God has created him and pastored a successful church. Praise the Lord. And I've heard of the, the other end of the spectrum, a businessman tried to be a pastor. Couldn't, couldn't understand why his, you know, as far as administration goes, he was wired that way. He was able to kind of, you know, the income and expenses, the supply, demand, etc., etc. He was able to kind of analyze that way. But his, the, the ministry just wasn't lifting off. And then a prophet came to town and just says, look, you're in the wrong place. You're not meant to pastor. You're meant to be a businessman. So he changed into where God had created him and designed him to be. And he made heaps of money for the kingdom. He was a successful business kingdoman. Kingdom businessman. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So even if you were called, I like this, this is a quote. I can't remember who, who said this, but I think this is fantastic. Even if you were called to be a street sweeper in the kingdom, then sweep those streets as if you were Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, we're still in 1 Corinthians 12. Jump down now to verse 21. We're on to the next part here. And it says, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. Now what we see here with these body parts is that they're saying to other body parts, you're not welcome here. We don't really have need of you. Now here's a um, here's just a bit of wisdom. Before we say something to someone else, is it going to build them? Now I understand we can do some friendly banter sometimes, as long as the recipient knows it's friendly banter. I'm all cool with that. I give Max a hard time, for instance, and he gives me a hard time back. <laughs> That's cool. We understand that. However, some people have said some horrendous things to one another. That shouldn't be happening here in the church. That can, be, that can stay out there in the world. I don't want to be responsible, for instance, of someone's eternity because of something that I've said to them. I've heard of this instance, a, um, a homosexual came, came into a church uh, with his boyfriend and someone said something to them like, what are you even doing here? Now I can understand the parameters, but I don't want to have that blood on my hands. Now, I know we all have these kind of issues with homosexuality and stuff. You know, sin is sin. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. Let's call it for what it is. But sometimes I think the church has a history of treating homosexuals worse than anybody else. And I've got to be honest. I, 
when I came into the kingdom, I wasn't homophobic as such, but I thought that was a pretty gross lifestyle and quite sinful and stuff. And God had to do a work in me. In fact, he took me to Zacchaeus in the Bible one time when I was, I was contemplating these things and, and Zacchaeus was rejected by everybody. He was a chief tax collector, which means the Jews labeled him a traitor. And not only that, he was rich in, in, in Jericho. Jericho was a wealthy city. And so he was the chief tax collector and he ripped off everybody. And so he was despised and hated by his own culture. So he might as well have thought, you know what, since I'm... Everybody hates me. I might as well just be in a job that everybody hates. But there was this potential that Jesus saw that nobody else could. And sometimes we may have some uh, unchurchy kind of people walk through our doors. They may look horrendous and may not fit our persona of who we think Christians should look like but we need to see potential hey these guys could be something great I've had some arguments about Christianity and faith with some with unbelievers I, I said to them he goes, you guys would make great Christians <laughs> imagine the people you guys could reach you know what that kind of non-judgmental view and saying, hey, you, you could be great in the kingdom changes their thinking on how Christian, they think Christians are because Christians for a long time have been pretty judgmental. You know, we, uh, we often quote Luke 6.38 uh, as a uh, given, it'll be given unto you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured out into your lap. We often quote that as a giving verse. But if you read that within its context, the scripture before in verse 37 says, judge not and you won't be judged. For if you judge, the same measure will be measured back to you. I don't know about you, but I don't want to judge somebody else and have that measure of judgment be put back to me, poured out into my lap, running over. The church is a place that needs to build people up. And I don't want to be responsible for somebody else's eternity for something I've said. There's that old saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So here's a rule. I say this to my children. Think before you speak. Think before you act. Just, just hold fast for a few moments. Don't be so quick. Don't be so hasty to, to, to speak. So let's contribute to the vision that this is a house of, house of God, this is the house of the word of God, that this is a house of prayer, but this is also a place for believers to be built up. Amen. Let's turn to uh, verses 24 down here in 1 Corinthians 12. In closing, it says, But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, have given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, that means division, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, then all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. This is, to me, this is where I kind of want Rhema Family Church to be heading towards. Where if somebody in here is burdened with something, they are free to come and share their burdens and the rest of us will help them carry it. Amen. Well, if one member is, is honored in some way, then we will rejoice with them. Yes, not kind of look at them with disdain and go, that should have been me. <laughs> But I like this verse 26. When one, one member suffers, then we all suffer. We all carry, we all empathize. We will carry you through this. And that's the strength of a church. The world shouldn't have, the world doesn't have that. The 
They just don't. But a church can be a place where this, is, this kind of support and care and empathy is found. Because this is my father's house. This is my father's house. Praise the Lord. So this is a place where we celebrate blessing in your life, and if you suffer, we will help you carry the load. This is where we're heading. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm thankful to Rhema Family Church for many reasons. When I came here as a 19-year-old, there was times in here where I went through huge seasons of sin addicted to stuff, um, made huge messes everywhere. But I always found myself every Sunday coming back to church. I was far from God. In my own personal walk, in my own personal life, I could barely hear him at all sometimes. And I'll be sitting down the back there thinking, man, I just feel dirtier than rocks. I'm dirtier than dirt. I'm lower than dirt. I'm rocks. <laughs> and uh, I think what really kept me during those waiting seasons really is the commitment to the, house of the God, uh, to the house of God, to the house of the Lord. Sometimes I didn't want to read the Bible. Sometimes I didn't want to pray. I mean, when you're far from God, the last thing that you kind of really want to do is look at the Bible. Am I going to even understand it anyway? Or am I, am I just going to get angry reading it? Or even pray. But when I found myself here in the house of the Lord, I'd, I'd hear the preacher preach. And his words were cut. And you know, the word, well, it talks about the word is, is like a rock that smashes, it's like a hammer that smashes rocks into pieces. And sometimes I'd find myself broken in a good way and so I'd come up here in these times and you know I'd just give myself over to God over and over again but I found myself yeah, it is it is powerful and I'd say I'd say to God I'd go, God here I am just just deal with me. Just rebuke me. Discipline me. A pastor would come down and the word of the Lord for me was, was life and was forgiveness and peace. And I've seen a number of people up here and I would say to them, I said, hey, I know where you are at with God. And I know you seem far away and I know there's a pull on the world. There's a pull pulling you on the world to leave church, to come out here into the world and enjoy the world. But if you're able to grip onto the church, to the house of the Lord, then something will have to give. Something will have to give. And it's just, I've seen too many let go of the wrong hand. Now, if it wasn't for me setting my affection on the house of the Lord, I don't think I'd be here. I'm thankful to my pastors. I'm thankful to Pastor Colin. Thankful to Pastor Dave. But it's a, it's a house. And we could be quite, um, we could be quite casual about this. We can be quite casual with our, uh, and sometimes we can get into ob obligation, like, I've been there, 
you know, you're obligated to be here and that kind of thing, and especially if you're on rosters or whatever. And sometimes we're a bit flippant with our attendance and that kind of stuff here, but if you're in a waiting season, if you want to win in life, if you want to see breakthrough in your life and to, and to walk in the, in the plans that God has for you, our affections must be set here on the house of God. The house of my God. Where the word of God is being preached. Where the house of the Lord is, is a pr- house of prayer. I'm thankful that even though I was far away from God, even though I was in this kind of waiting season, in this kind of holding pattern, that I had Rhema Family Church. I'm thankful to the house. Turn with me to um, Psalms. Go to Psalm 23. Now I've got this chronological Bible at home which kind of um, changes the order of the um, of Psalms and stuff and and puts them together in, in chronological time. And many s- scholars believe that this Psalm 23 was written by David when he was a shepherd and he was about to deliver his um, the lunch to his brothers who were standing at the, uh, the battle lines against the Philistines. This is before he takes Goliath. So we see here in Psalm 23 and verse 1, David writes this psalm, the song to God. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. For though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell. I don't know about you. I like to think. I was about my father's business when Jesus comes back. And if he came back on a Sunday, I'd like to find, think that he would find me here. Worshipping and praising God. I'd like to think when Jesus comes back that I was in his house. Worshipping him and glorifying him. Hearing his word. Bringing my supply here. I was listening to Rick Warren one time and he was saying that he can tell the difference between people that just attend his church and people that are members. Some people come to him and go, oh, man, uh, you have a great church there, Pastor Rick. Pastor Rick. And so he, he could tell that they weren't actually connected to, to him. But when people claim this place, this gathering here is their own, I say, this is our house. We have fellowship meals here on first month. We pray here on on Tuesdays and Sunday mornings. We have two services here. They're they're, they're owning this. This It's a part of who they are. They're, They're the members of the body. They're not going to be the false teeth. Whether they, they, they're here some days and they're, they're, they're not here. So I just want to challenge you if, you. if you are, when we're heading into the new year, even you may, you may want to commit now. You need to up your commitment to the house of God. It's not, for, for, it's not really for our good, it's for your own good. I'm not saying that to, to 
make our house. I really believe this is the word of the Lord for, for many of us. Don't step back as far as your commitment to the house of the Lord goes. Step forward. Remember I was standing up here as a young man and Pastor Colin put his hand on my shoulder and he says, you know what, God has big plans for you. But here are some things that I need you to do. I need you to up your commitment and your faithfulness to the house. And man, I, I did everything <laughs> leading up to that point. Almost burned myself into the ground. But I always found myself here. If I'm ever in the city, I'm going to be here. Pastor, I remember Pastor Colin didn't think I was going to be here, so he, he ran. I would normally do the notices and that. And so he took the notices and he found me in church. And he goes, oh, I thought you'd be having a rest. You would have came back late last night. And I says, I did. But if I'm in the city, I'm here in the, on a Sunday morning, I'm here in the house. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (sighs) Father, we just worship you. We praise your name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your challenge, Lord God. Father, we renew our commitments to you, Lord. And Father God, I thank you that your will be done, your kingdom come in our lives. And Father, we thank you that you're working a a work in us. That you're perfecting that which concerns us, Lord. And Father, we just uh, we thank you for taking us from strength to strength, to glory to glory. And Father, I just thank you for each heart that's in here this morning. I thank you that we are pliable, Father God, that we, our, our ground is soft in our hearts, Father, we receive your word that it bears fruit. And Father God, I just thank you for this season of waiting, this waiting time. And Father God, I just I thank you for development, Lord God, and Father, I just thank you for when breakthrough comes, we're ready for it, in Jesus' name. Thank you for change in our lives, Lord God. Thank you for moving us into new levels. Remember your servant, Dr. Cole, used to say that all life has lived on at levels and arrived at in stages. We thank you for the next level. Praise the Lord. And the next level, the next stage. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. If you're in here, just let, let's have every eye closed and Every head bowed. I just want to challenge you, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to just hear my words. When I was younger, I knew about Jesus. I I heard about him. In church, I was raised in a Catholic church. And I knew the stories. I often found myself on, on Morai that, you know, we'd have a, a minister talk to us there about the Lord and priest and mass and stuff. But it wasn't until I met Jesus where everything changed, where he was this real person that reveals himself to us through the Holy Spirit, where my life changed where I found salvation. Now I'd like to promise you that your life would be better. But it would be hard. But saved life isn't easy, it's hard. But it's a challenge I'm, I was willing to pick up my sword every day and go to battle. Now I'm, I want you to not leave here without him. Because receiving him as Lord of your life, bowing your knee, changes everything.
what I can promise you is that you will have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. What I can promise you is that he will lead you and guide you in the ways that you should go. What I can promise you is that you will be a light to your family, to your whānau. They won't understand it sometimes. You will be rejected sometimes. It won't be all roses. But then your family will have hope. And all that requires is you to make a choice. To bow your knee before the Lord and say yes. That doesn't have to be here in church. But if it is, it's a, let us celebrate with you. Let us support you. But you can do it in the, in the quiet of your home. As long as you're real with God. So if there's anybody here this morning that wants to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, just raise your hand. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, it is health and life to us. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for keeping us thus far, for giving us peace, for letting us know that you are God. We thank you for this house, Lord God. We thank you for grounding us here. We thank you for our fathers in the faith. We thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, each other, Lord God. Thank you for the inspirations that they are in our lives. And Father God, I thank you that this is a place where the word is preached. I thank you that this is a place of prayer. I thank you that this is a place where we build each other up and encourage us to keep going forward. And Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for all good things that you have in store for this place. You know, I thank you, Lord, that this house is ready for the influx of, of new souls, Lord God, and in all sorts of shapes and forms. Hallelujah. That we point them to Jesus and we don't point them away. And Father God, we just thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Excellent.